Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. In addition to the podcast, I also upload technique videos, and in both types of videos, I include direct links from one section to the other down in the video description. This week, I have a few tidbits. I wanna share with you an excursion I went on last weekend to the Gale Woods Farm sheep shearing event. I wanna share some vintage knitting books and update you on my Roaring Twenties sweater project. So let's get started. So a couple of tidbits. The first one is that the International Wolf Center, which I talked about a month or so ago, I knit a pair of mittens that included some uh, cuffs that, that had wolf fur in them. Their auction, their silent auction starts today and is completely online. And there are a number of items that were spun the, the yarn was spun and the items were knit by some really high level, well-known um, spinning instructors um, that you might be interested in seeing. So I'll, key, I'll put a, a link down in the video description so you can go take a look at all of the items in the auction that benefits the International Wolf Center. There are many, many sorts of events uh, that are being of all types that are being canceled around the world, including events related to knitting. Uh, and I know that Vogue Knitting Live in Seattle has been postponed and there are other events. I think there's one in Chicago that was canceled. Uh, I am planning on going to a couple of events in April that may or may not happen. We'll, we'll find out. In the meantime, um, if you are feeling like trapped at home and, and as knitters, we all know what to do with extra spare time, we can knit. Um, but the Minnesota Knitters Guild we canceled our guild meeting for this coming Tuesday, but they are hosting, let's see, what do they call it? They call it um, the Get Away From It All Knit Along. So it's an online knit along um, being hosted on Ravelry. It's in the Minnesota Knitters Guild Ravelry group. Again, I'll put a link down in the description, but it's it's there's no talk of, of coronavirus, of toilet paper shortages, <laughs> nothing like that in that, in that uh, thread, only uh, sharing things that you're knitting and they're gonna be doing prizes and they don't know how long it's gonna last. We'll, we'll see, it's at least until the end of March and then we'll see what happens after that. So if any of you are, are wanting to make contact and are maybe missing going to your knitting group or even don't have an inning group, but are, are feeling kind of stuck at home and isolated, uh, that might be a fun way for you to get out in a way in the world and share knitting with others. So this past weekend, I volunteered as part of the Minnesota Knitters Guild to sit at a table and demonstrate knitting. And all I knew before I went was that it was at a place called Gale Woods Farm, which I was not familiar with, and that it was a sheep shearing event and we were gonna be demonstrating knitting. So in the few days before I went, I found out a little bit more that the, that the farm is actually owned by the Three Rivers Park District. So I live in Hennepin County and the county is bordered by three rivers. One is the Crow River on the west, uh, the Mississippi River on the east, that's what divides us from St. Paul. And then along the su southern part is uh, the Minnesota River. So that's why they call it the Three Rivers Park District. There's a family, the Gale family, owned this farm since 1922. So they had three or four different generations had been farming on it. And they wanted to keep the land as one piece. They didn't want it to get to be sold off and turned into housing developments or retail or, or anything like that. They wanted it kept as it is. And so they donated it to the Parks District who has turned it into an educational uh, facility. And so they, they, uh, they have chickens, they have different farm animals. I think they do some crop uh, some crop growing as well. They have a greenhouse there. So they, they have all these things so that people can come and learn more about how our food is grown and, and all that sort of thing. Because nowadays so many kids live in urban areas, they don't really know, and even adults for that matter, don't really know um, where all of these products come from. 
So uh, this was the sheep shearing event and it was one of the first times, I think it's the first time uh, that I have seen somebody who really knew what they were doing when they were shearing. I've seen shearing in person and a lot of times the people that are shearing are talking and they're stopping so you don't really get a sense of how quickly somebody who really knows what they're doing can shear sheep. I think the first time I saw a sheep being sheared, it was when I was living in New Zealand. <laughs> and they have a lot of sheep there. My mother came to visit me. We went to a town called Rotorua and we saw this, and we saw like sheepdog exhibitions and what the sheepdogs could do. And then we saw somebody shear a sheep and I swear he did it in like a minute. It was so fast, I couldn't believe it. So that was sort of the standard in my mind for well, that's that's what it's like to shear a sheep. And I've seen some, you know, videos of people who have small flocks and they shear their own sheep and they're, they, they can get it done, but they're, you know, they're not doing it, you know, uh, thousands of them. So they're not that expert at it. Um, but this guy um, was, he was really fast. I think he did it in under two minutes. He just, you know, went through and he just did it so smoothly. Uh, so it was really fun to see. You could buy a, a fleece there. I didn't need a fleece. I didn't know about it ahead of time. I didn't want to buy one, but they were selling fleeces for, I don't know, something like $9 a pound. And they had, they would, uh, they would shear one sheep and somebody would bring the fleece over to the uh, room next door to that. And they had it on a table of rollers and they were skirting it, taking all the little yucky bits out. And then they were testing it to, to see how sound the uh, the fiber was and then you could buy it if you wanted to. The building I was in was like the educational building it was connected to the barn and they had uh, somebody there with um, drum carters and showing people how the, the fleece can be uh, processed into something that could then be spun. They had someone from the Minnesota Valley watershed. I don't know if it's called watershed project. He was uh, spinning a uh, a yarn showing the yarn that she had spun um, talking about that whole process and then our table we were just uh, demonstrating knitting and showing people how to knit if they wanted to to learn a little bit of something so that was really fun I always like to go to those events it always helps me uh, meet other people in the guild and it also lets me uh, show people who might be new to knitting um, how to knit and, and let them know or people who already know how to knit let them know about the guild and the activities that we have so that's always fun for me um, to get out and do that kind of thing oh look at that strawberry hat someone made for you so I've been showing in the past couple of weeks a set of books that I bought from the UK that were published in the 1940s. And I was missing one book. I'd ordered it, it hadn't come, it still doesn't come. I'm going to have to get a, a refund for that book and then order it from someone else. Um, but instead, today, what I want to show you are some of the American knitting manuals that I have been buying from around the same time frame. So it's kind of an interesting way to compare and contrast. Um, it's, I'm going to show you three books. Uh, they're from a company called Minerva. So there's, there were some really big yarn companies back there. are a lot of yarn companies, but there are sort of three really big ones. I think of Fleischer's, Columbia, and then Minerva is uh, the third one that I think of as being really big there. Again, there were, there were other yarn companies. The Roaring Twenty sweater I'm knitting was from a company called Corticelli. Um, and they went out of business in the mid thirties. So the books I'm going to show you, one of them was from 1936, one from 1941 and one from 1951. And it's a really interesting span of years in this particular uh, company because it was so different from anything I've seen in any other um, vintage knitting books. And, and what's I think really interesting is how it kind of, sets the stage for for some of the ways that knitting patterns in some regions of the world are presented today, particularly Japanese knitting patterns and to some extent European knitting patterns have some of these elements that I'm seeing in the in these 1930s, 1940s, um, new way to knit, they called it. So I have three 
uh, knitting books, knitting manuals from Minerva. They're, they were published in different years. Um, two of them are, are, say, complete knitting manuals. So we have volume 44. This one was published, I believe, in 1936. Let's see. Yes, this is copyright 1936. Uh, and then, uh, then I have volume 61. Again, complete knitting manual published in, I believe it was 1941. And then the last one is, it doesn't say complete knitting manual, it's just knitting manual. It's volume 82 and the price has gone up to 75 cents. I believe this is 1951. So these were published in a total of 15 years apart. These are pretty widely available. You can find them on eBay and Etsy and Amazon and various places. The Minerva Complete Knitting Manual, either volume 44 or volume 61. What's really interesting about these is they basically developed a different way of presenting knitting patterns than I have seen anywhere. And it was really interesting to see to see what was going on here. So one of the things that they did back then was these American knitting companies, as they would show you their knitting factory and tell you all about how great their, uh, their yarns are. So they, they'd start with that. Um, so they have, you know, how to wind up your yarn, all the, the knitting stitches and purling stitches. Interesting about the left leaning decrease. They just say to slip the stitch from left needle to right needle as for purling without working it. To pass a slip stitch over a knit stitch, PSSO, slip one stitch, knit one stitch, bring the slip stitch over the knit um, stitch as in binding off. This is kind of an interesting way to present this uh, um, decrease because it's going to twist the top stitch. And there's really no reason to do the slip a stitch and then knit a stitch and pass one over uh, if you're going to slip a zip to purl. You might as well just knit both of them through the back loops and then they both be twisted. But if the top one's gonna to be twisted, there's no point in doing the slip. Uh, I haven't been able to find a book that, um, I think there was one that maybe showed uh, slipping a zip to knit, um, but this one certainly didn't. And you'll see here, they've got some grafting down here, which they call weaving. And uh, they often in these books uh, to graft without having things on the needle, uh, they'll tell you to press the fabric first to keep the stitches locked into place. So they've also got um, crochet um, stitches in here. And so it's Minerva's new method knit to fit. And so they have all of these different steps, but the main thing that's interesting about this um, is they're showing you what the pieces look like. They're basically having you create a schematic, doing all your measurements, and then they tell you um, how to knit accordingly. So you, they have you, um, I don't know if each of these represents one inch or a half an inch. Um, it depends on sometimes these books, they have one inch versus uh, half inch. But they should have you draw out all of these measurements and how to do it. And then they, um, the, the actual knitting instructions are pretty sparse. So then they, they tell you how to use this chart and they have you write down the number of stitches that you're gonna cast on, how big the waist is, how, how many inches between here and here. And then they'll have things like uh, here's how many stitches you're going to be decreasing, 11 of them, uh, how many you're gonna bind off, six, and then you, you know how many squares and how many rows these things are gonna happen. So they're, they're basically, it's, in a way, it kind of reminds me of Japanese patterns where they have a chart and they have some of the information, but you're knitting from the chart. Uh, although um, they, they really go uh, pretty step by step at the beginning so that you can learn how to use these charts. And they tell you um, the proportions for, um, for skirts and things like this. But, but here's something interesting, knitting a raglan all in one piece. Remember, this is 1936. A knit in raglan is begun at the neck. For almost all women, the rule is to cast on the equivalent of 13 inches plus four stitches, one for each seam stitch. 
And then they're telling you to, you know, to use a circular needle. This is again, 1936. Then they're showing you how to finish off a garment, how to block it, uh, all, the, all of the instructions for that. And then they, they actually do have some garment patterns. So they're, they're pretty simple garments that follow this whole schematic um, uh, business, but they have simple garments, mostly stockinette, and then they have a little bit of a stitch dictionary in the back. Um, as well. So when I saw this, I was just like, I, I was amazed <laughs> that, that that was what was going on here. Uh, the second book, which was published five years later, takes it a step further. They really, uh, they have all kinds of garments in here. Um, they've got baby items, they've got uh, things for adults, they've got, again, Stitch Dictionary, they've got a few crochet items. Um, and uh, and they use these schematics and they've kind of, they, they've really refined the system here. This reminds me of kind of the Euro European um, style in a way that the B stands for bind off. So bind off seven um, and then it's T, uh, uh, two R for every two rows uh, five times. So that is just uh, amazing <laughs> that they, they've also created this sort of shorthand for a lot of the instructions. So you see, you're seeing uh, less measurements and stuff on these schematics because you're using the grid to help you with the scale. But what, what I like about this system, I was wondering how long they kept this up. And it, cause I, I had never seen this in any other vintage patterns. And I wondered if, if they just, they created this method and they thought it would be a really uh, good way of doing it. And it didn't catch on with anyone else. I'm not sure. In one of these books, they, they talked about with the blocking, how uh, don't forget that the front is longer than the back when you're blocking. And another thing that they, they did was they made the fronts an inch wider um, than the backs. And that was, that was something I'd been seeing in all of the vintage patterns. The fronts were always larger than the back and sometimes a number of inches larger depending on the fashion at the time. Um, but in these books, they also made the front an inch longer um, than the back. And that I think is to accommodate the bust. So they weren't doing short row shaping. They certainly could have in this, in, in these mostly stockinette sw uh, sweaters, uh, but they, they added extra length and extra width in order to accommodate the bust. So this one, this is the one published in 1951. And this one um, has given up on the schematics. Uh, you don't even see a schematic, Never mind using it for, um, for knitting from, but what they do have is multiple sizes. Oh, there's that sweater I was looking for. <laughs> I was trying to find this a while back. I think this is really cool. Uh, they, they're going to much finer gauges um, by this point in the 50s because the sweaters are much more uh, figure forming uh, for one. Um, but they, they have multiple sizes. They have four sizes rather than just one size and then telling you how to make it bigger for yourself. They are supplying you with four sizes, but no schematic, which I thought was interesting. Not even a schematic like we would have today just kind of shows you uh, where, uh, what the measurements are at different places. So that is kind of the evolution of the Minerva uh, knitting manuals um, between 1936 and 1951. Last week, I had completed the knitting on my uh, Roaring Twenties sweater, but I still had about 10% of the sweater left to do because there's quite a bit that has to be crocheted and I hadn't started that. The crochet was something that I was been kind of worried about um, for a couple of reasons. One is I don't have a lot of experience with crochet and I was concerned that because the neck has to be crocheted that if I didn't do a good job that would really mess up the entire sweater because it would be so obvious. So I've been practicing my crochet <laughs> throughout the process to make sure I I got my gauge down. I had to figure out that oh in order to do the crocheted bits I actually needed to split the yarn I was using which was worsted weight yarn. I had to split it in half so that I could use two of the four plies for the crocheted parts which have to be done on a much smaller hook uh, and in order to create a more delicate fabric than uh, what is um, the body of the sweaters was knit at. So, uh, so I've been practicing that, trying to get consistent. 
and um, and I, I did all the, the different squares for the neck and, and the next um, thing I have to do is, is kind of join them all together and do edgings. And so I'm gonna show you um, that. And I'm also gonna show you, explain to you the problem that I had had when I was just finishing the knitting last week. And I had run into a problem where um, the fact that I had switched from garter stitch to stockinette and then switched to a different color uh, at the beginning um, created one effect which I understood and it was pretty familiar with but the but when I was coming down working from the top down and switching colors and then switching textures I had some unexpected things happen that I had to fix and so I want to explain to you uh, what it happened originally and then why that happened and then how I solved that. So the way this works is that, uh, I don't have these all exactly in the right orientation, but um, they're going to get chained together. So I'm going to use this uh, sand color. I'm going to work across the top of the yellow one. Then I'm going to work two chain stitches. Then I'm going to work single crochet top, across the top of those two single crochet, you know, all the way across, all the way around till I go all the way around. And then I will take the black uh, yarn and I will do single crochet all the way around every edge all the way all the way all the way all the way and then a row of the white all the way around so basically I'm creating like a necklace and then that will get uh, put around the neck and sewn onto the neckline in that way so one of the things I'm gonna have to do is to make sure that uh, these pieces are going to add up to the right circumference. Um, my calculations say that they will, because these are two inches wide, uh, but, but we'll see what happens. And you'll see how, how curly these, um, these are right now, which is, I guess, what stockinette or uh, a single crochet does. And I will be going around the edges, so that might alleviate a, a little bit. My plan is that I may have to uh, kill the fiber in order to get it to behave. So this is a combination of superwash wool and acrylic and maybe some nylon. And if you, you can kill wool if you get it too high a temperature uh, and it just kind of becomes a, a little bit lifeless. But acrylic is a way that you can, or killing is something you can do to acrylic to get it to block the way you want because acrylic, you can block it to a certain shape and then it'll just go back to whatever its original shape was. So I, I have um, some other squares that I, I knit some, or I crocheted some of these in black by accident thinking I needed some. Um, so I'm gonna practice killing those to see how that works. But that's that's the next step is with is with this uh, neck to chain them all together and then to do the edging all the way around. So it could be I kill the squares and then I can do the edging and everything will lie flat. I'm I'm not completely sure uh, what I'm going to do. So the way the Roaring Twenties sweater is constructed is that you cast on at the bottom of the back. You work a garter stitch hem, then you switch to working stockinette for the body of the sweater, and then at the end you switch back to working garter stitch. Now I don't have the same number of garter stitch ridges just because I wasn't paying attention to the same number. In the actual sweater there are 10 garter stitch ridges, which is one of, one of these, and you, you get a, a ridge by working two rows. You knit on the, on the right side of the work and you knit on the wrong side of the work. And then you get one of these ridges. So these represent uh, two rows of knitting. So you start at the bottom with garter stitch. You switch to stockinette for the whole body of the sweater and then you switch back to garter stitch. There's something else going on, which is that you're also switching colors. So that after you switch from garter stitch to stockinette, you work, you continue working, the pattern calls for working one row uh, in this main background color and then switching to black working two rows of black and then switching back to the plain color um, and in and, and in that case you're working two rows of the sand and then you start working your motifs or whatever so this is an abbreviated form of that 
uh, but the entire sweater is knit from the bottom up to the shoulder and then over the top and then back down the front. So you knit it all in one piece. So you start at the bottom of the back and you end at the bottom of the front. So when I was finishing the hem, right before I bound off, I just took a look. I was comparing um, this section right here to the uh, beginning section and I realized I had three rows of sand color here and I had none down here. And I was like, how did that happen? So the pattern tells you to start uh, by casting on and working 10 ribs, they called it, of garter stitch. So it says to work 10 ribs. So if you know that every rib is two rows, that would indicate that you need to work 20 rows. Well, I did the long tail cast on. And the long tail cast on is twisted loops that are knit as you cast on. So even though the front of the cast on looks like these angled, smooth strands of yarn, if you look at the base, what you see are these, these twisted loops in the front. And then above that, you actually have rows of knits and rows of pearls. But if you look on the back side of the cast on edge, you will see that there is an, a ridge right at the edge because those loops, those twisted loops, they're, they're, they're twisted on the front, but on the back side you see the, the pearl bumps that you would see with any um, knitted stitch, the back side of any knitted stitch. So what I have here is I have three ribs or ridges on this side of the work, and I have three ridges on this side of the work, but I've actually only worked five rows. So I technically have enough uh, ribs to begin um, the next step of the pattern, which is to work a row of sand. So this is the point I'm done with the ridges. I'm supposed to switch to stockinette. Um, it doesn't say to knit a row. It doesn't say to purl a row. It says to work a row. Now, when I look at my garter stitch uh, fabric, I want to make a decision about which face the fabric I want to be the right side and which is the wrong side. And I really like my knitting to have a frame at the bottom. I like seeing the smooth side of the cast on on the right side of the work. Many, many knitters, maybe more knitters, um, uh, prefer to have the garter ridges go all the way down to the bottom. I, I don't look like that. I really like the frame. So I'm at the point where I have all of the, the ribs that I'm supposed to have, and now I'm supposed to work one row in sand, and then I'm supposed to join the black and work two rows of black. It doesn't say knit, doesn't say purl, doesn't say any of that. What I want is for this to be the right side of the fabric. That means for me to work a row in this color, I'm going to knit it. If I wanted this to be the right side of the work, then I would purl across. And if I purled across, then I would really only have two ribs on this side, but it wouldn't matter because it would be the back side of the work. So I want um, this to be the right side of the work and I need to switch to stockinette. So whether I'm working in garter stitch or stockinette, since this is the right side of the work, I need to knit. So I've worked one row and now I'm supposed to join the black. The thing is, I, ha I would have to join the black on the right side of the work. And these, these black stripes would all then be joined on the wrong side of the work. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. I just not, I'm not used to that. And so I prefer to do things that I'm used to or that I like. And so I made the decision to work a second row um, in this particular color, rather than having only one row between the garter stitch um, and the black stripe, I would have uh, two rows. So I worked another row, worked a, a row of pearl across here. So now when we look at the front, we see I have two rows of stockinette instead of one row like the pattern called for. So now I join um, my black yarn and I'm going to work two rows of black. Uh, and now let's just look for a second what's happening. I have, like I said, I have my two rows of, of sand stockinette, but now what do I have? I have three rows of sand stockinette. Why is that? Well, that's because 
I have sand stitches on the needle. They, those aren't knits or pearls. It's not until they come off the needle that they become a row of stitches. So now I have three rows of sand. And I realized when I did that, I'm like, oh, okay, well, that's fine. I'll have three rows. That first row is kind of hidden because of the way the ridges uh, come out of the fabric. That's fine. It takes two passes across stitches in order to create a row of stitches. I'm, create, I'm knitting with the black yarn, but what I'm knitting are the sand yarn, is the sand loops. So the black loops that are on the needle, those aren't knits or pearls. They're just potential stitches. They haven't become anything yet. I could uh, work these on the wrong side of the work. I could work these as knits or I could work these as pearls. Uh, and however I work them this time is, is how they are going to present in the actual fabric. But at this point in time, they aren't anything. They're just potential stitches. So now I've worked two rows of black, but I actually only have one row of knitted stitches. Again, these stitches up here, I've established a row of color, but I haven't established a row of knitted or purled stitches. So what I've done here was I established a color and a stitch pattern. I st the sand color in garter stitch. I switched the stitch pattern to stockinette, then I switched the color to black. Now I'm supposed to knit uh, two rows of the sand color and then I'm supposed to start my color motifs and work all the way up um, to the shoulder and all the way back down. So I'm just gonna work a few rows of the sand to represent the body of the sweater. Okay, so now I've worked the body of my sweater and I'm, I'm headed down toward the hem again and it's time to do another black stripe. So this time, I'm, I haven't uh, changed my stitch pattern, but I'm changing my color. So I'm working in the reverse of what I did the first time. So now I have my two rows of black and I'm going to work my one row of sand. And now it's time to change the stitch pattern. So I began to work in garter stitch. I'm on the wrong side of the work, so I'm going to knit across in garter stitch. And this is where I ran into my trouble. What you see here is that I have my two rows of black and then it goes right into the garter stitch. I don't have a row of stockinette because remember when I was working across uh, in sand, I was actually creating black stockinette. I wasn't creating anything. I was just establishing a new color. So when I began working in garter stitch on the back, I ended up with no rows of stockinette here. So that's how I ended up in this situation. So I had to figure out, well, how am I going to get those three rows? I only worked one extra row of sand, and yet I ended up with no rows of sand here. And I was trying to figure out what I could have done differently in order for it to have worked out. What I could have done was to work the one row of sand across the, the right side knit row, and then I could have joined the black and done my two rows across here, and that would have given me that second row of stockinette in the sand. And then again, I would have been joining the black on a, on a wrong side row and coming back, and I would have uh, begun knitting a, in the sand color, the one row of sand, I would have been working the black stitches off the needle and putting the sand color on the needle. And then when I worked this row, garter stitch is a knit on the right side, is a knit on every row. So I would have had to knit across. And then I would have ended up um, with just one row of stockinette. I'm like, well, that still isn't right. But what the final piece that is missing is that this piece of fabric is not going to be viewed in this way. Instead, this is the back. So this is what you see on the back. You see those two rows of stockinette. And on the front, you're going to see this. And what you see here is that now it looks like I have two rows of stockinette. And that's because of the change in the texture. When you look at these stitches in this direction, 
these bumps here represent the heads of the stitches and it's the heads of the stitches that tell us if something is a knit or a purl and the base of those stitches uh, are not on the surface they're they're in, in behind the work but when we look at it in this way what was the base of the stitches is now the, appear to be the heads of the stitches and they're behind the work which means they they present as stockinette. So that's one way that I could have done things differently. If I had just joined the black yarn at the beginning of a wrong side row, it would have worked out okay once I realized that the way it would be viewed would be uh, correct. Instead, what I did was after I established uh, the color, the sand color, then I worked two more rows. I actually worked two more rows of the sand color. So now I've worked three rows in sand, but I have two rows of stockinette stitch below the needle, as you can see here. And then when I turn and I create my garter stitch, when I do that, it still looks like I have only two rows of stockinette until you realize that it will be viewed from this perspective. And then I have the three rows of sand colored stockinette, just like I have on the back side. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group. Rocks, rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.